Welcome, friends. It's almost midnight, and you've found your way to the Pikecast. Come along as we careen through the catalog of the most formative horror writer of our young adult days, Christopher Pike. From adult perspectives, we'll revisit these YA books our parents probably would never have let us read had they known what lie inside. We tackle one book per episode in a freewheeling and unbiased chat. So grab your battered paperback, pull the flashlight from the kitchen drawer, climb under your bed covers, and devour a good book with us. Greetings, fellow pikers, and welcome to the Pike Cast. I'm Cooper Beckett, and I'm thrilled to be joined by my lovely co host, Cassie. Hello. Today, we're beginning our coverage of Christopher Pike's The Final Friends trilogy, starting with 1988's book number one, The Party. We're going to be dissecting it in great detail, spoiling each and every plot twist, so consider yourself warned. If you're enjoying the podcast, please leave us a review on the podcast service of your choice. And we see you all on Twitter loving the podcast, so please leave <laughs> us a review. It's very important. Yes. <laughs> We're beyond excited to welcome our guest piker this week, Katie Lilly, who we first became acquainted with through the Haunted Outfit, her Insta, where she draws characters from teen horror novels focusing on their clothing. Since then, she started a podcast that may appeal to all of you pikers, Super Chillers. They review books from R.L. Stein, Point Horror, and other scary teen lit. We're so happy to have you here, Katie. Thanks, Cooper. Thanks, Cassie. <laughs> so happy to be here. <laughs> Well, we we have a we have quite a show ahead. Um, just judging by our pre-discussion, but before we dig into that, uh, we have our first we have our guest questions. How did you discover Pike, Katie? So I've been a big reader, uh, you know, forever. But especially when I was in like middle school and high school, you know, I would just head to the library and pick up a big stack of scary books. Um, I was probably more of an R.L. Stein girl back then mm -hmm. um, because the Christopher Pike books, I felt like were a little bit mature for me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> maybe even nowadays, they're too mature for me. <laughs> but, um, you know, I really remember loving a few of them. I loved Chain Letter. I, um, I really liked Die Softly and I really liked... Uh, bury me deeply. <laughs> uh, yes. um, those are the ones that stuck out in my mind. When what's the thing that keeps him and uh, I, I suppose other uh, teen horror on your mind, because it is such a, a front loaded thing in your entire online presence. <laughs> yeah. I probably like a lot of people um, was sort of looking for a way to cope with the pandemic and I turned <laughs> to nostalgia. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of people have, are sort of revisiting those comforting things from the 90s. Um, and yeah, I've just kind of found that it's this mindless hobby that I can do. <laughs> yeah. um, and I've met a lot of cool friends through it. So yeah, it's been great. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the people online surrounding these books are just so overwhelmingly positive it seems yeah i think so too i think in middle school we all would have been friends yes. <laughs> i think so too <laughs> and we would have been huddled together to stay away from the awful middle schoolers who would look yeah. at us oh you're reading yeah, yeah we would have had a book exactly. club yeah totally. <laughs> be in the Agreed. library and our gym teacher would be like will you get back to the gym <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, totally. Okay, Cassie, let's move into Magic Fire. Will you read the back of the book for me? Yes. They wanted to throw a party. When Mesa High closed, more than half the students were sent to Tab High. Among them were Jessica Hart and her best friends, Sarah Cantrell, Polly McCoy, and Polly's younger sister, Alice. Together, they decided to have a get to know each other party. They invited dozens of people. Michael Olson, shy as he was brilliant, Nick Gretler, powerful and insecure, Bill Skater, the handsome quarterback, Claire Hillary, the gorgeous cheerleader, and Bubba, whom all the girls loved and hated. But some people came that weren't invited, and the evening ended in horror. Most figured it was a suicide. 
they figured wrong. That's, dun, dun, dun. A, that's a lot of information. It's a lot of names. And I just can't with how many yeah. names are yeah. in the back of this book. <laughs> I mean, it is very accurate. And I'm glad I didn't read the back of the book first because I had no idea what was going to happen in this book and very little did. But I was still surprised when it actually happened. So let's look at the cover now. Um, this is a Brian Kotsky painting. And since this is 1988, this is still among the earlier ones. These people all look so much older than high school. Is it where there's like a body outline on the floor and yeah. like half the book is just color blocked? I think Michael's wearing a, a Which one's cardigan Michael? there. I assume. Mike? I, I don't know. I mean, they're Who's they're the one with the mullet? I'm going to guess Bubba. Yeah, he seems like he would be a Bubba. Yeah, he looks like a Bubba. Yeah, there's one I with like, like the little guy, pointed uh, shoes with his with his hands on his hips, looking yes. angry. Yeah, at the <laughs> yeah. So it's I mean I, the the couple they're looking right at the camera. So like it's they're the weird. only ones who know that this is a book cover. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a great cover. I mean, really, it would be better if the artwork took up far more of it. It, that is true. It is weird that it's only like half the book. Yeah. I mean, I guess, well, in 88, Christopher Pike was this popular that it was his name that was the selling point. It's Christopher Pike's final friends. Oh, fair. Because his name is huge. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. Hmm. I mean, it, it does sort of, I mean, no, actually, no, it does not capture what's inside the book because it is not uh, happening at a football game where everyone's looking for each other. <laughs> no that's true also i think i thought they were in like a bedroom when the body like, it, the yeah this looks outside yeah or like i don't know there's like a couch oh, no no so... i see i see furniture in the background yeah but it doesn't look like a bed it looks like a no, sofa, like a living room or i don't know dining area or something and the tagline is very intense it was their last year of school maybe the last year of their lives <laughs> That's like, way more intense really? than the book. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Not, like, nobody was threatened here, barely. Yeah, like, this no, is... There was no threat at all until suddenly someone died. And then most of them are just like, yeah, it was suicide. So yeah. where's the threat? <sighs> Maybe yeah. book two and three. I don't know. We'll, well see. We'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll get there. We'll get there. And, uh, and this is going to be an interesting. See, Katie has volunteered to come along on the, the most unique journey we've been on so far, where we're going to hit three books in a row. In a series. Yeah. So, Guys, we're going on a journey together. We are. Yes, it's we exciting. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move to the Midnight Club because there are so <sighs> many fucking people in this book. And I know I say that almost every time. But literally, there are more characters on my list than there ever have been. Yeah. <laughs> ever. There are a lot. So we'll start... With Jessica Hart, our ostensible Pike lead. And you know how we know she's a Pike lead? Because Jessica knew she was pretty. Enough people had told her that for enough years, and they couldn't all be wrong. Her face was a perfect oval with a firm chin and, everybody's ready for it, a wide full mouth that she had trained to smile even when she didn't feel much like smiling. Her hair and eyes matched beautifully. The former was dark brown, long and wavy, with a sheen that had stayed with her from infancy. The latter, an even darker brown, large and round, giving her either a playful or nasty look, depending on her mood. And with a carefully controlled diet and daily jogs around the park, she kept her figure slim and supple. She Gross, even picked weird. up a tan this summer. and then. As if that's not enough, her thought process then adds, I sound practically perfect. <laughs> so maybe it's not really a major Pike character. Like, very few are that confident in themselves. No, she does not seem like a normal Pike girl to me. Like, I do not like Jessica, and I <laughs> normally like the plucky Pike girls. But she was, like, she was jealous, and she was rude, and she was mean, and, like, fat shamey, and ugh, yes. ugh, I don't like her. Very fat, Jamie. How about you, Katie? Yeah, I um, I didn't have a strong connection with Jessica either. Um, you know, she gives kind of like some Lila Fowler energy for fans of Sweet Valley High. She's very wealthy <laughs> and kind of um, 
you know, just snobby and not a girl that I would personally want to get to know. Um, but she does have some good girlfriends, which I guess speaks to her character. <laughs> Well, I don't know. Do any of these characters actually really like each other, except Alex, uh, Alice and Michael? Because all they're yeah. doing is trying to take each other's girlfriends or blackmailing each other into going on dates or it's really unusual. No, I think it's yeah. super usual for high school, though. Like, that's, Well, that's true. No, you're, you're always right. friends. With, like, you have social circles with people most of them you don't even like. You'll just like one of or two of them. And then the other ones, you're just like, nah, they're just always there. I don't really like them. And I was really thrown off. So our next character is Alice McCoy. I was really thrown off when I realized how much younger she was than everyone else. Because usually it's the peer group first. And we don't meet the peer group character, Polly, Alice's older sister, until later. So Alice has bright brown blonde curls, very basic description. Um, and there's there's a, a brief moment of maybe bisexuality uh, hinting. She didn't understand how Alice, a nice enough looking girl, but certainly no fairy princess, also bitchy, Jessica, drew girls and guys alike to her in droves. <laughs> so, you know, maybe a little queer coding, probably not. Um but Alice, and then by association, Polly, had lost both her parents. So we have some absentee parents as well. I like Alice more than Polly. Well, Alice is almost a cipher here. Like, I didn't really realize it until the end. And here's, listeners, is your first reminder that we're talking spoilers when Alice killed herself. But she's she's so dreamy the entire book. And... She's dating someone who may or may not exist, really. <laughs> Even though people talk to him, I'm still not sure he exists. I feel like he's going to be like a much bigger part in the other books because I cannot imagine why he was mentioned like so creepily here, but then not yeah. a, like an actual part. Like, so I don't, obviously I'm not, I don't need to like know in advance we'll get there in like a week or whatever, <laughs> yeah, a couple we'll of weeks, there, yeah. but like. I just I feel like there was a lot here that they that was literally just set up in a lot yeah. of these characters. It, there were too many of them for it to be set up. Like he really should have condensed here. Like because I don't remember half of these people. No, I know, I know, and <laughs> I feel like he was really writing like an adult novel sized book for teens. Like if what he really wanted to do was write a six hundred page book. I suppose that's fine. But you have to have more. Like, really, this book is almost all set up. And like, so one of my favorite books of all time, literally, is Fast Times at Ridgemont High, the book. That's a and book? It is. And it's wonderful. I have a PDF because it's next to impossible to buy. So I will send it to you. It is wonderful. And it is written as literally a year in these teenagers' lives. And at times, that's what this book felt like, a year in these teenagers' lives. Unfortunately, these teenagers aren't doing anything terribly interesting, whereas the Fast Times of Ridgemont High kids are. So it's like the whole time I'm waiting, it's like, will you just do something? Like, anything? I sort of feel that the reason that there are so many characters is because he's trying to set up this whodunit situation with all these yeah. different suspects. But if you get to the end of the book, it's really clear that most of the characters can't be suspects. Like it's impossible for them to have been <laughs> right. involved in this crime. So he like sets them all up as suspects, but then immediately rules out like 90% of them. <laughs> And, you know, it, it is, I find it so odd because the other book this feels the most like is Remember Me. Yes, with the roof, right? Yeah. So I someone climbed over a roof, someone died, looks like suicide, big group of people, cop that party. shows up. But in Remember Me, that happens in what, the first quarter? And then the rest of the book is first from the girl's point of view. I mean, Remember Me is wonderful, and I love Remember Me. 
But I feel like we could have learned all we need to know about these characters after the death. Honestly, there was so much we learned about these characters that we just didn't need to know. Like, it yeah. was not relevant to anything, it feels like. Like, maybe I will be proved wrong later. So yeah, well, maybe I'll be biting my own words. But, like, as it stands for this book, it just felt like I would read pages and pages. And then I'd just be like, what What the hell? Like, why? <laughs> what was that for? Like, that did not need – that didn't matter. Like, what? <laughs> I just – I, it was so bizarre. And I was like, surely in the next chapter, something's going to actually happen. They're, right. No, they're now at a, they're now at 7-Eleven. Nope. Now they're at a, what, a, what was a mall my favorite to go to a movie. Can I just, I, I really need, cause I've been holding on to this baked <laughs> potato restaurant. Yes, the yes. baked potato restaurant. Is that a fucking baked real potato thing? restaurant. I would, I, love to go there. I would love to as well, but <laughs> do they only serve baked potatoes? Is it like, do they have like a whole menu of different kind of baked potatoes? I'm so, I honestly sat here, like I folded my book open and just sat for a minute and was like thinking like how many different ways could I mean, this it is, work? It is definitely possible that it is a baked potato specialty restaurant do you know so it? Like Does the it whole... exist? no no I, I don't know i, I okay. just googled i found a whole lot of restaurants that serve baked potatoes so <laughs> listeners you're gonna have to tell us in california in the 80s was there a baked potato restaurant because it's the, definitely possible it's the baked potato restaurant oh, yes. and baked no, potato you're right. restaurant is capitalized you're right baked potato and restaurant like it's like the cheesecake factory but yeah, it's exactly, the baked potato exactly. restaurant it's so bizarre i've never in my life like it sounds delicious i would 10, 10 out of 10 would go and eat and like be so full imagine if it was a buffet a buffet yeah well i, I was potato. thinking it it's so we had yeah. a restaurant so in good. chicago called sweet tomatoes oh yes was i've been a, there so it's salad. a salad bar based restaurant. So you go and get the salad bar, but then there's all this other stuff too. So you figure a baked potato restaurant could be you walk in, you pay, you pick up a giant baked potato, you put anything you fucking want on it. Oh my God. Huh? This is yeah, so like a frozen yogurt, please. Yes. Doesn't sound great. It's yeah. Oh, yo, it's potato. Well, yes. okay, I'll, work on that. Yo. I'll work on the name. And... <laughs> I what about now? potato, comma, yo? <laughs> <laughs> Exclamation point. This must be why Pike went with the baked potato restaurant. The baked potato <laughs> restaurant. He was like, potato yo doesn't work. I can't do that in this book. <laughs> I'm sure he thought of that first. <laughs> but honestly, I would not be surprised if it if it existed. I really need to know. Please, yeah. somebody, if so, you yeah, are listening listeners, to this, you know. Please. In in California, in the 80s, baked potato restaurant. The... You know what? I'll, anywhere. If you lived anywhere and you had a place called, because maybe he didn't live here and he, he was somewhere no, else. No, that's true. thought they're everywhere. So if you just have ever seen the baked potato restaurant existing, please let me know. Just I want to hear girl. about it. Tell yeah, me about it. I want to hear about it. Thank you. Okay, so let's move on to Polly McCoy. Hold on. Well, first of all. Alice, we actually have some reasonably important information about because the fact that she's an artist and is painting paintings weirdly after dating Clark, that seems important. I don't know if it is because the book does not tell us, but it seems important. She also, in a Pike tradition, stole Clark from her older sister, Polly, who also dated Clark. It doesn't really seem like point. she stole him so much as he got tired of Polly and moved on to Alice. Well, that also is a Pike trope. You know, like the, the girl who gets all upset when the boyfriend moves on because she's just not an interesting character. Or like, um, what was that one, The Lost Mind, where they were like triplets or something, you know? Oh, yeah, right. He reminded me of that guy. Yeah. Yeah. I don't remember that. I mean, he's got to be supernatural also. There's no way this is not a supernatural story. I just imagine Katie over there because she has all the secrets and she knows, like, yeah, she, she read them all. She's, she's just like, like can't tell you. Together. Yeah. Every time we say something wrong, she's just like, ha wrong. <laughs> wrong. Which is basically how Grady played us with, uh, yes, it's with true. Remember Me. It's true. <laughs> so we appreciate your candor, Katie. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm keeping it a secret for now, but I will say you guys are going to love it. <laughs> i'm so excited i was like after finishing this i was like dude this book was not good and i'm not looking forward to reading the others but after hearing you tell me like even just that stuff happened that's enough for me like yeah. anything please just give well, me you something. figure now they've set the table 
Yeah, I know so everybody. All should 30 be the characters. Meal, right? Unless he introduces like 30 more characters. <laughs> no, I'm ready for the baked potato. Let's go. <laughs> so <laughs> Polly uh, is weird. Wouldn't you agree? Polly is weird. Is she weird? She's That's really she's weird. Basic. She's it, got what, a nervous what? disposition. She, like, re- re- this is a book where a character decides to change a bulb at night in the dark with wet hands for no reason on a ladder in a room in the dark and then seems to almost get electrocuted probably has a concussion and that's it like when she goes outside at the end after the after the um electrocution she's got to have a concussion there right she's being weird She's no one's saying anything. Right? Well, because I was just thinking maybe something happens that we don't know because we haven't read the others. So maybe it's just right, like right. we're not supposed to know if she is being weird or like, but like when we look back on it, we're like, oh, Cooper was yeah. right. She was being well, weird. Well, I'm calling it right now. She's weird. <laughs> She's super and... weird. And I will just say this isn't her first experience with being electrocuted, <laughs> if that sparks any interest. <laughs> really? Well, yeah. I, I did see, I noticed this this little, uh, so we know that their parents died, but also that Polly was in the hospital. And that's only thrown out really briefly that Polly was in the hospital. So, yeah, there's that. Um, just to drive home Pike's... Uh, obsession with diet polly had already gotten a hold of a candy bar she ate a lot of sweets these days and it showed especially in her face it was a pity when thin polly was a doll i wrote rude there and marked that with a do not like yeah. this colored tab um so polly unlike polly's sister her hair was dark almost black with red highlights indeed in almost every respect their looks differed alice was a waif Polly was a peasant. She had big breasts and a bigger butt. Polly sounds like a babe. She does. Who also is giving blood every two months. I and, loved and, that. Yeah. yeah. She's, and, and gets shit for eating a candy bar when her blood sugar is low. So rude. That's that's like uh, when, when Jack Donnie gets mad at Liz Lemon for eating a cookie in the middle of the day. And she says, I gave blood. And he says, does that burn calories? <laughs> but I mean, Jack Donnie, he's, Donaghy's a dick. We know that. That's the point. I don't know. It really upset me. I feel now, like there she's is- just kind of meant to be this um, kind of the opposite of what people see as Alice. Like Alice is so ethereal. She's described mm-hmm. as this carefree darling <laughs> and Polly is so uptight and she's like quite yeah. impulsive. Um, so she's kind of like the anti Alice, I guess. And it is worth mentioning. There is a, there's a passage here that seems important again, not in this book, but maybe in the future. Polly didn't believe in reincarnation or life after death. When you were dead, when you died, you were dead. It was pretty simple. On the other hand, she occasionally did wonder about vampires, about demons in general. Yeah. You don't put that in a book unless it's it's important. I mean, yeah. maybe. <laughs> <laughs> also, if, if Pike is, is riding by the seat of his pants here, who knows where he could go next? Who knows? Katie knows. <laughs> Well, and and some of our Twitter followers have been uh, that's true, yes, poking at me with my comments on this book. So the, the, it could go anywhere. Honestly, Wait, do they it like it or do they not like it? Well, no. Uh, the the few conversations I've had did not like this book, but emphasized that it goes in weird places. Good. Oh, that makes me see now. I'm like even double double excited. Yeah. If if you're going to be bad, at least be weird. Yes. Right. Agreed. Yeah. <laughs> Let's move on to Sarah Cantrell, who is a character that's basically, I'm betting Pike's wish fulfillment, like he wishes he could be this person in (laughs) high school, who says whatever she wants, who goes and is elected student body president 
despite not wanting to be, and then decides to cancel homecoming just because I bet Pike wanted to do that. <laughs> I mean, I know I wanted to do that. So I'm, I'm totally on board with Sarah and her bizarre uh, storyline. Like that's her storyline. That's Sarah in general. Yeah. Sarah's and, pretty sassy. Yeah. And I like her. Yeah. Though she she also gets saddled with a, a guy in – she wants to take a guy that her friend's in love with plot because of her and uh, – let me find this name. Russ. Russ Desmond from the track team uh, because Polly is also in love with Russ, but Russ thinks Polly is Sarah. But I think she. I don't think she wants to steal him because she met him first. He like knocked her over. True. And then he met Polly later when he was drunk, and he didn't even know he met Polly. He thought it was Sarah. But Sarah doesn't care. No. Also, she, yeah. That's also, true. we've we've got other problems with that Sarah and uh, and again, I lost his name. Russ Desmond. Yeah. See, he's that important to me. <laughs> he's one of the few that actually like stood out just because of his like scene where he stands up for the guy like a little late, but still. Well, but he also uh, goes to pick her up for a date with oh, no right, money, yes. Uh, yes, yes. bad hair, uh, eating a sandwich on he her front know porch. It was a date. He was just told to show up at the house. He by knew the other it was girl. a date. Jessica didn't even tell him. She was just like, "Just show up. Like it'll be fine. Here, yeah. don't tell her I said so." He said he well, he was like, "Wait, you want to go eat?" And she's like, "Yeah, we're supposed to be going on a date." He's like, "Oh, okay, all right." That's also a problem. I'm not saying he shouldn't have cleaned up and stuff and like had the common <laughs> sense to be like, maybe I shouldn't be just showing up to a person's house because of what their friend is saying. But like, <laughs> I, I, there were parts of it that I was just like, I've had friends that have just shown up like in PJs and I was just like, wait, I thought we were going out to eat. Like, what the hell? Like, <laughs> go get dressed. I'd, I'd go out to eat in PJs. To the the baked potato. I have potato, gone out to, the baked to the baked potato, potato restaurant. restaurant. <laughs> the baked potato restaurant. Yes. I don't know. I don't know. They have a dress code, actually. Yeah. Ooh, do, they seem do, like they a have, uh, do they have one of those uh, closets of blazers in case you forget your own? Actually, you have to wear a potato sack. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you have to hop around like a potato sack race. Yeah, it's uh, it's very theme. It's a theme. and it, that's very inconvenient for a buffet restaurant, <laughs> especially one where your little potatoes like rolling around on yeah. your tray. You're just hopping, yeah. trying. <laughs> so let's get some data about Ken, uh, Sarah Cantrell. Uh, she, Sarah wrinkled her nose. She could do a lot with her nose. <laughs> she had the same control over it that most people had over their mouths. <laughs> Hold I on. just want everybody to sit and think about that before <laughs> I move on. I think I skipped over that line somehow because, wait, what the, what? Yeah. Can she, like, I'm think, I'm literally moving my mouth right now and I'm like, mm, I don't want to be able to do this with my nose. This is no, I, weird. I feel like it just means she could wiggle her nose and she had a cute nose. That's fine. But but this, uh, again, this is this is Jessica's opinion, I think, because Jessica seems to be our point of view character. This did not mean, however, that it was an unusually large nose. Sarah was cute. Now, again, I want you to think about that pair of lines before I move on. It was not an unusually large nose, everybody. Sarah was cute. And here we go. She could be as ruthless on herself as she was on everybody else. She rated an eight on a scale of one to 14. <laughs> what a unique person. Who? What? <laughs> what? Like there is a traditional scale of human looks and it is 10. Everybody knows that. What is 14? <laughs> She had rust-colored hair cut straight above her shoulders, hazel eyes, and a slightly orange tan <laughs> that somehow got deeper in the winter because she frequently wore orange tops and pants to complement her coloring. Jessica told her she looked like Halloween. I'll tell you, I want to go out with 
the uh, outspoken girl who looks like Halloween. Oh, that's very on brand for you. That's true. That is very on brand for me. I feel like Sarah is one evil deed away from being a sugar sister. (laughs) But she's got to have a little evil in her, and we don't see that yet. We have not seen the evil. Okay, we uh, we haven't even gotten through uh, a quarter of the characters. Let's move on to Michael Olsen, who seems to be the male lead. Would he's we agree with fine. that? Yeah, he's yeah. fine. He's all right. Uh, his parents are divorced, so he checks that pike box. Uh, he's living with his mother, and he seems to be taking care of her, uh, so she doesn't date bad people. That's a pike checklist. He works an unbelievable amount. And let me tell you, I did the math on this. So he works 50 hours a week at the 7-Eleven. So that, let's break it down. Even if he worked 10 hours a day, Saturday and Sunday, he would have to work an average of six hours every other day, plus six to seven hours of school. When is he seeing any of his friends? Because he seems to have a a lot of time on his hands to work like that. A lot of his friends come to the 7-Eleven. That's true. But we rarely see him at the 7-Eleven, except (laughs) at the beginning when his friend tries to rob the 7-Eleven. So yeah, there's that. Mike has thick black hair and eyebrows, pleasantly friendly features, Yet it was his eyes that sparked her interest. I believe this is Jessica again. There was an extraordinary alertness and intelligence in them. A sharpness she had never seen before in anyone her age. And she seems to like him, but is friend zoning him. And he likes her, but is friend zoning her so he doesn't appear to like her. And it's frustrating and obnoxious. Agreed. Speaking of frustrating and obnoxious, let's move on to Nick Grutler, who as a character is not frustrating or obnoxious, but Pike's insistence in being as stereotypical as he possibly can about this poor guy from the ghetto in East L.A. (sighs) Nick Gretler was six feet four, wiry as a hungry animal, and as black as midnight. This description was very embarrassing for Christopher It really is. Like, I I mean, it's it's obviously part of the problematic section. But here he came from East L.A. where youth gangs ruled. None of them had the pent-up emotion that came from having to master the use of a switchblade by age 12 just to survive. He had not killed anyone. No, he had been forced to stab. No one he had been forced to stab, at least, had died in his presence. But he had seen more violence than most war vets. And he had always hated it. And worse, in his own mind, for someone of his size and strength, been afraid of it. Like we've seen this character in, it feels like almost every other Pike book we read in the last few months. And it's just as obnoxious every time like this, this book has two people of color, Nick and Maria Gonzalez. And so Nick's stereotype is he's from East LA and part of a gang and quick-tempered, and once out, so we know that character. Maria's stereotype is that her parents are illegal immigrants. So the only Hispanic character in this book is an illegal. Maybe this was his attempt at, you know, hinting that he understands the struggles of different (laughs) populations or something, and maybe he thought that was, like, the better approach to take, but it's just extremely problematic when we look back at it. And honestly, I'll agree with you, Katie. I think for sure, this is Pike trying to put one, uh, one uh, hand characters that are not often seen in these types of novels because they're not. Um, He's trying to put situations 
and cultures that are not often seen in these types of books because they're not. He just, he hangs a lantern on it in such a way that it feels so obvious and perfunctory yeah. and upsetting. Yeah. That, like, good on you, Pike, for trying. You rarely succeed. <laughs> Except for maybe Indian culture, and I don't know because I don't know a lot of people in uh, from the Indian culture who would tell me. But maybe our listeners uh, might, although I imagine Pike's audience is mostly white people. Yeah, I think, well, I mean, we've looked up some of the mythology stuff before, like, from India, and we didn't, we found that, like, it was... In yeah, I feel like he is what, far more accurate on his yeah. descriptions of Indian culture than perhaps he is about East yeah. L.A. and <laughs> anyone else they're from. I definitely don't think it was like an intentional like, oh, I'm going to just like, I don't think he was doing it to like gain like clout or anything. I do oh, think no, he was trying no. to do something like good and like representational with it, but... It and is, Nick is a good guy. Yeah, and he like in the cold one too. They the guy who was in the gang, like they are good people, and yeah. I, I think that is something important to note as well because he could be writing them much more stereotypically. So I guess mm -hmm. props. For but I think it. the problematic <laughs> nature is is first of all they have to get out of their home base. Period, yeah. and which you know I'm sure a lot of people from East LA might say the same thing. They want to get out of East LA. But the problem is uh, own voices people writing about it is one thing. Yeah. Um, white suburban rich writer writing about it is a whole different thing. Yeah, because then it just seems like a like he's performing. Like it's not. Yeah. It's not authentic, and it's it's just like why you should just right. kind of like not. <laughs> okay, before we get to one of the people that uh, makes Nick's part even cringier, let's talk about. Bubba. <laughs> Bubba feels like an amalgam of every character Pike wants to be. <laughs> because he's great at computers. He's great at life. There are no obstacles. He He's, he's kind of chubby. He's not terribly handsome, but he can go out with anyone he wants. He picks up head cheerleader almost right in front of her boyfriend. I mean, he's also got we... kind of a bouginess about him, like ordering that Indian food when all the other students were just eating hot dogs at the basketball game. Oh my gosh! Oh, yeah. And he put the little napkin across his little lap. <laughs> yeah, I wrote in the book, and I was like, "Ooh, so fancy." <laughs> I mean, he knew that Bubba had a strong admiration for the female species, which is an obnoxious way to say that, or at least a powerful appreciation of them, which was almost the same thing. Girls who went out with Bubba once wanted to go out with Bubba twice. Ew. He knew how to satisfy them. I that's so I I wrote ew in my book next to that because that was <laughs> so gross. Like ew, whose whose point of view is that? Like ew, that's Michael's point of view. He needs to stop. Yeah. And then we also have b basically a Judd Apatow scene in the middle here. <laughs> and uh, where where Bubba is telling the, the boys, Nick and um, Michael, how to get girls. You don't want her to think she's overly important to you. That may offend your romantic ideals, Mike, but it's a fact. Human anim the human animal only desires what it can't have. True, you have to f make her feel wanted, but never loved. If she knows you can't live without her, then she'll also know she can see you whenever she wants. You want to operate from a position of strength. Always keep her in the dark, unsure of where she stands. Never listen to this friend. Yeah. Uh, and what's what's really funny is that specific character advice persists for like two decades still after this. 
You know, like that's exactly the advice that Andy gives Kevin on the office. That's exactly the advice that, um, again, Judd Apatow, uh, the, the characters who are not the main character give to the main character. In this case, I'm thinking probably Steve Carell in 40 year old virgin. It's, it's perplexing advice. I mean, it is the text of the book, the game. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just exhausted by players like that. I really am. And they don't strike me as good guys in any way. So to have a player like that, who's also named Bubba. <laughs> I mean, who the fuck is named Bubba by choice? Because his name isn't Bubba. His name is John Free. <laughs> I don't, I, I'm exhausted by the character. <laughs> what do you ladies think? I'm, he was where people started to blend for me because he uh -huh, was just, uh -huh. I, I don't know. I like, I know <laughs> he was a character and I can remember things that happened with him, but I honestly, like his personality, I just, I don't have much to say. He could have just been cut from the book and they could have had somebody else do everything that he did and I would have been no yeah. wiser. Would not have missed Bubba, is my opinion. Well, that's that's reasonable. I do have one person coming up that actually has no description, so probably also could not be in the book. But first, we have to get to The Rock, who, okay, I, I don't know if Pike was trying to say that people contain multitudes, but The Rock at once is a big brother and um, charity doer in the ghettos and also calls Nick boy and starts a fight with him for being in the weight room when other presumably nice white boys could be using the weights. I don't fucking know. I don't get it. What is he trying to say here? Not The Rock, Pike. What is Pike trying to say? Yeah, I mean, I guess there are a lot of people who have this, like, performative, charitable attitude where, you know, they go to church every Sunday, they do all of these nice things for the world, but at the same time, they're, like, evil, <laughs> despicable mm -hmm. people in reality. They just cover it up. So... That was sort of the vibe that I got from him from this book, but um, I will I will say that there is more to him than meets the eye that you'll learn about in the next book. Okay, fair enough. Uh, presumably, he did not get blinded when he, the uh, the chlorine got thrown on him, <laughs> which let me say, probably my favorite part of the book, because <laughs> I had never once thought of using chlorine as a weapon. I mean, that was yeah, pretty awesome. That was harsh. <laughs> I've got to say, that was pretty awesome. And gave Polly some fucking agency. Like, she is not going to have shit go down at her party. She'll fucking blind a guy. And also gave, gave Michael a little agency. Like, he clearly didn't like the guy. Especially after the shit that he was giving Nick. But still was trying to help him not go blind. And the award for worst spelling of a character's name goes to Claire, not Hillary, Hillary. <laughs> and everybody at home, that's spelled C-L-A-I-R, no E, H-I-L-R-E-Y. I, 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 would, I would go out on a limb and say no one by that name has ever existed. <laughs> no one. And all we really know about Claire is she's vapid. She's presumably the homecoming queen. She belongs in Playboy. This is literally stated in the text. And she is dating Bill Skater, the uh, homecoming king, presumably. Uh, yeah. And um, Bubba somehow 
manages to Svengali his way into a date with her. Yeah, I thought she kind of got the short end of the stick. I mean, this happens a lot in Pike's books. Where... She has to date Bubba, sure. Well, yeah, of course. <laughs> and if you believe Bubba, had sex with him like eight times. <laughs> but who knows what to believe there? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, she didn't do anything that was so horrible. But of course, since she's pretty, then she's automatically a monster. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, all we needed to do was hear that she wanted to go to L.A. to be a um, a model, and it would have that's completed true. the character. Yeah, she was blonde, tanned. Yeah. So that's Claire. Not really, didn't even really make a splash. Didn't even have to be on screen. So it, so it were. They just needed another blonde girl, except this one was had teased hair. Yeah. Bigger. So here's here's the next guy, Bill Skater, who Jessica is sort of in love with when she's also in love with Michael, I guess. I don't know. It's all a rich tapestry. The only reason I even remember Bill's name is because he shares the last name with Helter Skater, who famously <laughs> took a walk in Whisper of Death. Ooh. And to those who don't remember, that's the story with the razor sharp wall. I don't have anything on Bill Skater. Like, literally, there's just a space below his name. I have nothing. He's also blonde. And he, and he's, you know, handsome and roguish football player. Football who quarterback. Pike clearly despises as well. He's a hunk, according to he's, the girl. He, he's a hunk, yes. <laughs> hunk of Speaking something. of hunks, we also have another athlete who we're, I'm I feel like we're supposed to dislike I'm not sure he stands up uh, this is Russ Desmond he stands up for Nick in the locker room but then is drunk most of the rest of the time we see him and is I I'm not going to let you defend him too much Cassie he is the worst date you could ever be on I so he didn't know it was a date though well, he could have gone home. He could have said, "You know what? Let's do this another time." He sh he's 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 still awful. He was just like, "All right, I'll go along with this." Uh, I guess so he just went with it. And then, like when he realized like what was happening, he's like, "Oh, I shouldn't have said that." And the girl was upset, and he was like, mm. "To be fair, I'm not. I think it was really gross." And he was just like, "You have plenty of money. Give me some." I'd be like, I don't like care. He how literally much tried to take have, money out of his yeah, wallet. Yeah, like I feel like you, you need to go. You need to go walk home. Goodbye. Yeah. Like you, you're not just entitled to my shit. Like nah, that part I will agree with you. But when he showed up, I if he did not know it was a date and he showed up like that, like not realizing, just kind of sloppy and like, "Hey, what up, guys?" You know, like. No, I agree with that. It's just he kept going with it. That's the problem. Yeah, that's that's fair. That's fair. So we meet him when he runs into Sarah. The next time we see him, he's in a tree with an axe and he almost kills Polly <laughs> and then falls out of the tree because he's fucking drunk. <laughs> and we get this, which is a very Pike line. She liked him. And she didn't care that he was the guy Sarah had been searching for all night. She'd seen Clark first, and look where that had gotten her. Nowhere. When it came to love, you were a fool to be nice. I did like that line. Yeah. But and then Sarah, happened. on a date with him, says, what the hell am I doing with this guy? I agree, Sarah. I agree. Believe it or not, there are more characters. Oh, gosh. Now, this is this is literally the worst character in the book. Carl Katz Barber. <laughs> who literally brings a gun to his friend's place of business and pretends to rob it. 
I don't think he was pretending. I think he was actually trying to wrap. You think them. he was? Yeah, <laughs> I wouldn't so get away with it. Like maybe it wasn't loaded. Maybe he didn't intend to actually harm yeah. anybody, and he was like, "Just call my bluff." But he, if he had been given money, he would have taken it. Yeah, huh. I think he's like the Tasmanian devil. Everywhere <laughs> he goes, just turns into <laughs> chaos. Yeah, I agree with that. Oh. <sighs> Well, uh, Carl Barber, better known as Katz, was a 19-year-old loser. He had gone to Tab High for five years, taken advanced pottery and shop one, two, and three, and still hadn't graduated. He'd had a lifelong dream of joining the Marines, but without the diploma, they wouldn't take him. I didn't think the Marines were that discerning. I have no idea. But I could be wrong. Yeah, he's he's an absolutely worthless character, but he's a he's a suspect because he cl- could have climbed on the roof. So there's that. <sighs> Next, <laughs> let's talk about Clark. Okay. Okay. So no one wants. No one knows Clark's last name. Alice doesn't want anyone to meet him. Polly seems like she's still in love with him, but doesn't want Alice to have him, but also doesn't want to date him. Has the brightest green eyes Michael had ever seen. They practically glowed in the dark. Has a deep Southern accent, a disconcerting stare. He's basically nothing but skin. Like, it's so, like, I mean, oh, here. Uh, Bubba gestured in the direction of Clark. Who's that? A friend of Alice's. Wonderful. He looks dead. Do you think Clark's dead? Katie, you can't, you can't answer. I, I don't know. I don't know what he is. He just, cause they don't even explain it. Like he looks no. dead. How? Like, does he just look tired? Like, is he very like, I don't like, I, I don't know what to make of that. Like, are, is he just like bored? Yeah. I have no idea. Like he is, he is to a cipher to the point where it's not interesting. Like we literally just know nothing of importance about him. I mean, and if, if he's going to become a big character in the next two books, which I assume he is. And again, Katie, don't tell us. He really could have been written better in this one. All we really know about him is he has some sort of control over Alice. And when he met Polly, he he wanted to sketch her naked. And then when she refused, he just drew her naked anyway. <laughs> so let's move on. Because Clark is not a real character. <laughs> Mr. Bark. Ah, uh, Mr. Bark didn't look like someone who had seen battle. In fact, he looked remarkably like a plump, balding, middle-aged man who had taught high school political science all his life. He had frumpy gray slacks, black-rimmed glasses, and an itch on his inner thigh that he obviously couldn't wait to scratch. <laughs> what indeed? He didn't even look as though he had an itch. He had an itch. Maybe we just switched and now suddenly it's from his, like, more point of view. Maybe. I think it's in the middle of Jessica's thoughts, though. So uh, Sarah introduces him as a real liberal ex-vet for a teacher. He was in Vietnam and slaughtered little babies. And now he wants us selling the communists hydrogen bombs so he can have a clear conscience. There is so much wrapped up in that sentence. Yeah. And politically, it makes no sense. But as a character, he's ultimately fairly unimportant and thankfully is not a lecherous teacher like many other teachers in Pike's work where he's inappropriate with the girls. That's far too much uh, background information about a teacher who plays <laughs> no role in this story. <laughs> we yeah. don't need to know his political views or uh, his military history. <laughs> and, you know, it, it's fine for the girls to be talking about him, but then we get more information. We get too much information about him in general. And that's why I said it feels like um, Fast Times. 
because there are no parents in Fast Times at Ridgemont High. There's only teachers and students. We never meet a parent. And that's a cool thing because it's about, you know, teenagers' worlds are their school, basically. And the teachers are interesting in Fast Times because they have real lives and are interested. You know, but this is not. This is not interesting, Mr. Bark. Not at all. We do. <laughs> I, I thought we were going to make it through the entire book without getting a police officer. But we didn't. We get Lieutenant Keller, who is nothing to look at, although a trim six foot two and less than 40 years of age, again, younger than me, he struck Michael as soft, someone on the physical road downhill. He didn't know how to dress. He favored plaids, but the squares on his sport coat were much too big. He had a bald spot he tried to hide by parting his hair low and combing the thin brown strands over it. It only made his head look lopsided. And he had that grayish skin so often seen on the movie Sleazeball. <laughs> that's a lot. I like the gray skin part because I can, like, that's one part that I could actually, like, I can imagine that, yeah. like, in the movie. Yeah, like, in, totally. when there's, like, that creepy. And I assume Lieutenant Keller is going to become more important because he just has started his investigation and closed it because it's a suicide by the end of the book. That I did. So that was something that I thought while I was reading. I was like, wow, the cop is not very like he's not as in it as I would expect, given Pike's other books. So I was hoping, well, not hoping, but I was just like, maybe he is going to be more <laughs> prominent in the other books. I don't really have hopes. I'm going to be honest with you guys, but I think he might be. But what we do have and what is traditional in Pike's work from cops is a willingness to just look the other way and let characters do whatever the fuck they want. <laughs> because Michael shows up to a crime scene. Just because it's shutting down, it's still a crime scene and it's still someone else's house. He still does not live there. But Keller just lets him walk in, leaves the door unlocked for him, gives him a fatherly pat on the shoulder before he drives away. <laughs> yeah, they didn't really keep a tight crime scene back <laughs> no, in those no. days. I mean, speaking of loose crime scenes, Michael literally finds evidence, finds the shattered light bulb on the ground. So they didn't even sweep this up. Even if it's a suicide, they would still have done that. Bad cop work. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure we'll go more into it, but there <laughs> are, are you a lot sure, of... <laughs> Katie? Are you sure we will? <laughs> um, yeah, there's I... a lot of uh, evidence that didn't really point to this being a suicide. That's um... true. That's true. So what you're saying, Katie, is this may not have been a suicide? <laughs> I mean, who knows? Maybe not. I mean, like, it, it could anyone anyone's a suspect. Anyone it could really know at this point. Could be one one of sixty seven different characters. Yeah. Could be <laughs> the culprit here. So, before we delve too much into the plot, I have one more character who has no importance whatsoever, but her description is priceless. Pike, Cindy Fossmeyer. Cindy Fossmeyer had huge breasts. They were so huge that they fairly blotted out any personality she might have had. Oh, my God. Isn't that the perfect Pike description? I don't even know who. I don't even remember this girl. I don't remember her either. I just highlighted it. And it was, I, so I, I have no idea where in the book that happened, who was talking to her, who observed her giant breasts. I have no idea. But, yeah. That is one of Pike's, I don't care about this character, but they're going to, they're going to pay for something. They're going to be miserable for some reason. It's tough being a girl in Pike's world, because like, if you have huge breasts, then you are just like this empty headed bimbo or a bitch. And if you have small breasts, then like none of the guys want to talk to you. And you're just like this nerdy person. It's tough. They always want to talk to your chunky best friend. So it sounds so like friendly and loose. It sounds like uh, someone who doesn't have breasts imagining what it might be like to have breasts. 
Yeah, well, it doesn't really factor that much into your day-to-day life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, surprise, people want to date you regardless of what kind of boobs you have because people just like boobs in general a lot of the time. Like mm-hmm. big boobs, small boobs, they're just boobs. So they're like, whoa, cool, boobs, great, extra bonus in addition to liking you. Fantastic. But it did matter more in high school, right? I genuinely don't like – I've had boobs since I was like 11 or 12 and I do okay. not remember it ever being a big enough deal outside of other girls who would like tease me for it. Yeah. But okay. like, I never I, like. Well, then we're talking about junior like, high girls and junior high people in general are probably the worst people in the world. That's true. That's very true. I don't think we're ever as awful as we are in junior high. No, I've done I, because I'm in school to be an elementary education teacher. Um, oh, really? And I, yeah, and I, so I've done my observation hours at all the like the different grade levels. And middle school is literally the worst. Like, oh my god, it was. I had to sit in this science class, and the kids were literally screaming like really mean things about this teacher, like her weight and her appearance. And she was like, "Y'all, just do your worksheets." Like super calm at the desk, and wow. I was like, "Oh my god, I would be so depressed. Like I could not handle this. I'm too soft." And I was, I like, I sent her flowers after. I was like, I hope you have a good day. <laughs> like, you, I, you deserve a lot more than this. But congrats to you for sticking this out because I, I could not. No. Junior I mean, it is, is honestly a wonder that adults don't literally murder junior high kids. It's wild. They're so mean. They're because they so like. Mean. They start knowing. That's when they start learning how to use their viciousness. I think. And yeah. They're not, they don't have their conscience fully formed. So they're just vicious without caring about who it hurts. And it's just me speaking as somebody who used to be (laughs) that age is awful, mean, terrible side rant. (laughs) (laughs) So listeners, what we want you to do while we take a quick break is think back to your junior high days (laughs) and enjoy that gift from the pipe cast. (laughs) Sorry. Friends, where else can you get this kind of programming than the Pikecast? Nowhere, that's where. But we're trying to keep the lights on here. If you like what you're hearing and want it to keep happening, jump over to our Patreon at thepikecast.com slash Patreon and throw us a few bucks to join our private Discord server. Higher tiers get books, stickers, bookmarks, and even personalized shirts. That's thepikecast.com slash Patreon. Once, Osgood and Frost were the up-and-coming stars of the burgeoning paranormal investigation TV show craze before a hoax put an end to their friendship, partnership, and television careers. Now, over a decade later, Prudence Osgood is a barely functioning alcoholic ghost hunter for hire. Her yearning for mystery and adventure is reignited when she receives a cryptic, untraceable email. She can't resist embarking on an investigation that tugs threads, winding through a sinister series of disappearances, her former partner's family, and a night 20 years ago when a semi blew a yellow light and nearly killed her. Reviewers are calling Osgood as Gone a masterfully vulnerable and relatable 21st century horror story, and a bourbon-soaked supernatural mystery with sparkling dialogue that sticks the landing on LGBT characters, and main character Prudence Osgood, as tortured as she is clever, broken in all the best ways, and a true heroine for our times. Buy it today at As Good As Gone as a paperback, ebook, or audiobook narrated by me, J.J. Ronvier. Welcome back to the podcast. I hope you all enjoyed your little trip down horrible memory lane. <laughs> now we're moving in to remember me for <laughs> what I laughingly call a plot discussion. This book. Can I, can I do the plot discussion? Can I do the outline? Yes, please. Oh, okay. I love it. Okay, here we go. I've got this. They're a group of teenagers. They talk. They drive around. They go to different places. They talk. They talk. They talk. They talk so fucking much. They talk. And then they go to a party 
And then one of the girls gets shot in the face and there's blood everywhere. And that's like the only like cool scene <laughs> because there's blood <laughs> dripping down this girl's face into her hair onto the floor. Super cool. But it's a whodunit because we don't know which of these talking bitches actually killed her. But or she if killed she herself. killed herself. Yeah, it's a surprise. And yeah. then it ends on a fucking cliffhanger. Yeah. All that talking to give me a cliffhanger. And that's the plot. That's what happens in this book. I sat through 200 pages for that. <laughs> I, have, I have some strong feelings on the plot of this book. <laughs> now, Cassie, what you neglected to mention is the talking happens at distinctly different places. Oh, my God. First, There's... they talk in hallways. Oh, yes. Then they talk in an assembly. Then, which what feels like takes up half the book, people wander around a football game literally asking where the other people are. Yes. Like I I started highlighting, do you know where Jesse is? Where's Polly? Jessica asked. Like it I I have never read a book where people don't know where their friends are more <laughs> than in this book. It's because there's too many damn people. Can you keep track of 30 <laughs> fucking teenagers at once, dude? Like, I just, I cannot imagine having this many people whose whereabouts I give a fuck about at any given time. Like, and I'm not trying to be rude, but like, who cares? I literally wrote who cares so many times in my book because it was so frustrating. Like, where's Polly? I don't know. Where's Alice? I don't know. Where's the guy that Sarah wants yeah. Jessica to meet with Alice? And like, who? What? Why? Yeah, don't, don't go anywhere. I want to introduce you to someone. Okay. Oh, don't go anywhere. I want to introduce you to someone. Yeah. And like, this is, this is the stand missing. if Captain Trips didn't happen. I haven't read that since the last time you mentioned it. I'm sorry. <laughs> I know. But, but you know, the stand is about a disease that wipes out most of the world. I have a vague idea. Okay. That's what it's about. So okay. <laughs> this is the stand, an epic novel full of dozens and dozens and dozens of characters. If the most important thing in the book doesn't happen. So, I, okay, I, so there's a short story in one of King's collections that's like based off of the stand, but it's like two teenagers and they're like, there on is, beach yeah, or something. On the beach, yeah, and they just I talk. Think. And yeah. I fucking love that story and I love that collection. So I can hang with just talking with no like, <laughs> well, but that, sometimes that story is like 13 pages long, I think. That's fair. Yeah. When you put 200 pages of talking, then you start to get on my nerves. <laughs> so let me, let me give you a little bit of an idea of what actually does. So I, I took seemingly more notes than I've ever taken. Oh my God. How? Is, how did you take more notes on this book? Honestly, it's infuriating to me how many notes I have. Um, so I'm going to just give you some highlights of things that happen. Uh, they reference war games in the most obvious way they could, basically like um, uh, Ready Player One references things like, hey, remember mm -hmm. war games? We're going to do that thing. Hey, remember Ferris Bueller's Day Off where he changed his grades? We're going to do that thing. We're going to do that thing. It, it doesn't matter. But then they can't do that thing. Or they can, but they don't have the right codes. So they go find the codes. And I'm pretty sure, listeners, I did not go to check this. They find the codes in the exact same way. Matthew Broderick finds the codes in War Games, which is on a little drawer that slides out under the, the table. Listeners, tell me if I'm right. And has the passwords on it. To be fair, though, that's a pretty common way to find. Well, sure, but why give us exactly the same thing that happened in War Games? And then why tell us it's the same thing that happens in War Games? Because Pike really likes War Games and he wants to make sure that you guys got the reference. He's like, well, who does it? War Games is amazing. I mean, I, you also you want to be very careful to reference things that are better than the than the book you're reading in a book that you're reading. Because if you reference things that are better than it, people will think, man, I should just go watch War Games. Yeah. You're just like, let me just put this damn book down. There's too many people here. I'm going to go watch Matthew Broderick. <laughs> yeah. Because literally, yeah, it's Matthew Broderick and Ali Sheedy. And those are the characters. And then uh, Mr. L Dr. Lightman comes in, I think. It's been a while. And Joshua the computer. So there we go. There's the characters of War Games. <laughs> Now name all of the characters in this book without looking at the <laughs> list. <laughs> uh, so here's Sarah being a bitch to Polly for no reason. Uh, what happened to you? You have leaves in your hair, Sarah. Well, you have a fat ass, Polly. <laughs> and this evening I'll wash my hair and just look wonderful. And you'll still have a fat ass. 
What a monster. Why? I don't know. So we talked about how Michael and Jessica are basically accidentally friend zoning each other, both wishing each other would make a move. Like here after after Jill is uh, Jessica is in love with Bill Skater, but for a moment wishes that it had been Michael to ask her out that this was a real date instead of her just taking him out because she wants tutoring. But then Speaking of places where people show up, literally every member of the cast, I think, shows up at this movie they go out to. So we get a whole lot of, oh, Maria, hi, Nick, it's a small city. Then they ran into Bubba and Claire inside the 31 Flavors. Then they bumped into Sarah and Russ standing in line for the same movie. It's, it's like not even a book anymore. It's like, it's like a joke. Oh, nice. <laughs> uh, uh, you're reading this. <laughs> he's like, so, oh, the whole time he's ready, he's like, ha ha, you thought something was going to happen by now. <laughs> they're going to go to a movie now. <laughs> and then they're going to watch the movie. He's like, you have to sit through a whole book yeah. before something happens. <laughs> and then the good stuff comes in book two and three. <laughs> so let me, let me tell you a little bit about Russ's bad date. You know, I know, I know Cassie and I have had this conversation a few times here, but so Russ is drunk and because Sarah didn't know th that he was drunk, Sarah drives Russ's truck and gets pulled over and has to take a sobriety test and walk in a straight line with the breathalyzer and Russ is drunk sitting in the car. Um, but then here's the infuriating part. Jessica says, but do you like him? Are you having fun? And then again, later when Sarah leaves furious because he tried to take money out of her purse, she's crying and says, this is stupid. And Jessica hugs her and says, no, this just means you like him. Like I know People often like people who are bad for them. I know. But this is infuriating. Her friend should not be encouraging that. No. Because he's awful. I mean, not as bad as um, Bubba or Katz <laughs> or Bill Skater or Claire Hillray or The Rock or Mr. Bark, or Clark, or Lieutenant Keller, or other characters in this novel. But he's pretty bad. I think anyway. we had kind of like a fun first interaction, and she, you know, sort of built up a fake <laughs> yeah. relationship with him based on that. And so it was probably just disappointment that it wasn't going to be the relationship that she thought it would be. I mean, she wore this like sweet white dress and she said that was like uncharacteristic of her. Mm -hmm. Like usually she's more of a tomboy. So I can, I can see myself in her shoes there, just like being really excited for this experience and then having it just be such a disaster. Right. When then poor, uh, poor Sarah has to deal with her friend, Jessica, who, refuses to bail on the date no matter what i i feel like no matter what russ did jessica would still be like yeah but he's kind of cool right like you still like him like he's still going to be your boyfriend it's yeah. just obnoxious and another reason to dislike jessica yeah she's got her own problems so i wouldn't really <laughs> take her advice yes, yes. <laughs> Okay, so let's move on. We're let's let's move to the party. You remember this book is called The Party? Let's actually move to the party, which seems to be one of these ridiculously overblown parties in movies that make me very high anxiety because I know I could never clean up after it. The clean, yes, it's the clean cuz the thought of attending them is not so bad cuz it's actually kind of nice. Like there's like a little bit of like you're anonymous cuz you're just like lost in this big wild crowd. Yeah, right. If it's actually your house the entire time you're like don't break anything, don't spill anything. Like don't go in there. Oh my god. Like 
I, I can't handle, even imagine. No, I can't even handle like having one person at my house that doesn't already live here. I'm just like, God, watch where you step, please. This is my home. <laughs> like a party, I would just lose my shit. I am way too controlling and weird for that about my space. Yeah, totally. <laughs> um. <laughs> so yeah, the Rock starts some shit by taking. Nick's Sorry, you said the suit. rock and so you said it so much in conversation that I was just picturing the actual <laughs> rock. The, like when you're saying that, well, that's the problem with a character named the Rock. Now we have a the Rock who's basically officially the Rock forever. Like no one yes. else can be the Rock. Uh so so yeah, it was strange to see uh, Dwayne Johnson in this role of the <laughs> Rock here, um, being racist for some reason and then literally like like there's there's no more queer uh like masculine fragile masculinity queer baiting thing than the bully taking off someone else's uh pants it's it's so coded but maybe it wasn't in 1988 I feel like that was very, like, in 70s and 80s, like, in the horror movies and stuff, like, that was very, there was always, like, kind of coded, yeah. like, bullying going on from a lot of the popular jock guys. That's true. So he's awful. And then he gets, he gets uh, uh, chlorined and then winds up showering in the garage, it sounded like. Uh, like... So much is happening at the end of this book, and so many people are reviewing where people were, that it doesn't make much sense at all. But thankfully, we even have a diagram. Oh my Michael. gosh, the diagram! <laughs> so I love the diagram. I do. Yeah, I was. I was. Which also I was like, oh, is cool. like, remember me? Where yes. there was a diagram of the yep. apartment. I need to see when "Remember Me" was. I, was I don't just know if ask, it was which before. Which one of these was first? Or, let me see. Eighty nine. So the year so the after this. Year. That it, the. The what? proximity is ridiculous then. Okay, so it, it for me, I think he wrote the first book then, and he was like, okay, we're going to go in one direction. And he's like, but what if? <laughs> what if there were ghosts, and it's from the ghost's perspective, and we switched some stuff around, and then he had another trilogy, like two for yeah, one. He's so skilled. True. Look at this. And the other one is, you know, I mean, the first book, at least, is much better. Which is interesting because this one, the first book, fucking sucks. But apparently yeah. the next two are going to be more interesting. Whereas with <laughs> well, Remember we, we Me. We don't know that they're going to be good. Katie never said they'd be good. She said she thought we would like them more. Yes, but that's not a high bar. Hey, well, yeah. That's fair. I, you know I what? I like that we're talking about her like she's not here. I'm sorry. No, <laughs> I wasn't trying to. <laughs> you know, I'm going to say they're good. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Yes, I'm so excited. So well, it's I'm, like I'm, the exact opposite of Remember Me. How interesting. <laughs> yes. Look, the sequels suck. But from what I hear about the third book in this trilogy and the third book in that trilogy, they're both batshit insane. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. It's totally, uh, you know, an episode of Riverdale. But um, the thing that I do like about them is like every character like that we've been making fun of in this book there's a new side to them and Ooh. i think okay. there's a there's a lot more to explore so um i think next time we talk about book two uh it'll be fun to compare like our original oh absolutely viewpoint. oh i'm so excited <laughs> we're gonna be eating all of our words and all of our insults about certain people <laughs> i don't know let's not get that excited <laughs> that would be <laughs> that would be an amazing needle to thread on pike's part Gosh, maybe, maybe we're going to turn around and be like, too. The Rock, he's amazing. <laughs> Look at him help these these small inner city children. Claire Hillary, who, woo, we love her. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so then, let, let's, maybe, let's, see, I'm excited. Okay, we, 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 we need to stop speculating. Well, I mean, we can speculate, but we need to, we need to finish with this plot, as it were. Um, so then, uh, you know, Alice, uh, creepily tells Michael that she thinks of him as her dad and Jessica as her mom mm. and then kills herself. Yeah. Maybe. There we go. Maybe. Maybe. Well, 
from what we what we've seen, what what the book is tell, I I mean I don't know. Michael doesn't believe she killed herself, but she was found with a gun in her mouth and you know pulled the trigger, and the, it was very hard to believe that other people were like. I get what the cop is saying. It did look like she killed herself. Because nothing happens in this book, I was looking for clues everywhere. Like every dialogue that the characters had, I was interpreting it in so many different ways. <laughs> to to like, so I'm are sure there clues? Just... Are there actual clues? No, there's no. Oh, okay. I mean, from what I could tell, um, and I consider myself to be a pretty good detective. <laughs> But, um, you know, I think there's a lot of red herrings that are thrown around, but um, I was just being like overly analytical when I was going through it because I'm like, surely this isn't just a book filled with nonsense. Surely (laughs) every word was chosen carefully. (laughs) Fool me once, Pike. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I do want to. I do want to shout out before we move on to the next section. Uh, I don't know why it's in this section, but I think it's interesting. So Alice's art, the description of Alice's art, especially the last one, I find really cool. A few were of alien worlds, a purple, multi tentacled creature feeding its hungry babies, pieces of an American spacecraft, a hideous, shivering skeleton trapped on an ice planet trying to light a last match on the inside of its naked eye socket. I'd buy that painting right now. (laughs) Right now. I love it. Anyway, that's all we got for plot. Because there is none. Really. Really, there isn't. And there's no villain. Really. Because nothing happens. So there's no antagonist. Death. Death is the real antagonist. Death is the villain. You're right. This is like the Midnight Club. (laughs) Death by itself existing is the villain. (laughs) Yeah, because we're sad when people are dead. That's true. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Well, shall we move on to Thirst? (laughs) Sure. (laughs) Wow. Wow. Sure. Okay, so before we get into the sex, we have a lot of thirsty love. What? Before we get into the sex. <laughs> into sorry, the sex. Sounded, yeah. yeah, it sounded really funny. I'm sorry. It's okay. It, it, is, it is silly. Yeah. <laughs> so thirsty love, mostly from Jessica. She'd been lamenting Bill Skater's obvious interest in Claire Hillary. And I can't say that name without almost choking on it. Seriously. <laughs> Claire Hillary. The disappointment was silly, she knew. She had only started at the school. She couldn't have realistically expected the resident fox not to have some sort of girlfriend. She decided she would have to give it time. She had already made up her mind about one thing. She wanted to have sex with him. A girl is always supposed to remember her first. Why shouldn't I start with the best? Oh, Calm Jessica. down. Oh, oh my good God. God, Jessica. Okay. Either of you have any quotes that you want to go with, or shall I just dig in? Yeah, I honestly, I don't think I'm looking, and all of my tabs are orange, which means all of the things I marked are things that were problematic or I didn't <laughs> like. <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> Okay, so um, first of all, I found this line incredibly pretentious from Michael, who talks a lot about phonies. She is an empty phony devoid of an iota of intelligence. (laughs) Then Bubba nodded. True, but if you look past those superficial qualities, you'll see her true value, which is, it's hard to express in words. Just imagine her naked. That seems like a normal teen boy, like it does. It, 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 yeah. I mean, really, it just just because I hate them doesn't mean they're not realistic teenagers. Yeah, I do hate most teenagers. That's fair. Jessica had a new bikini she could wear, blue with white polka dots. It left little to the imagination. Maybe he would bump up against her in the water. <laughs> Ooh, so spicy! Ooh, yes. <laughs> Little water bump. 
at the same time, Bubba is planning to go diving to grab uh, uh, bra tops and bikini bottoms and just yank them right off. Just, She's a perv. Yeah, total perv. She, <laughs> Cassie, I apologize in advance. There is lactose in this sentence. <laughs> she set down her milk, folded her hands between her bare legs. He couldn't help noticing how much of her legs there was to notice. Nice skirt. Nice legs. <laughs> Where are they? I have no idea. I think Why? That's, that's I think she's sitting outside at school with the milk, I think. Ugh. <laughs> There's no reason to be drinking milk. Like no, no, well. Okay, so then we got Bubba. And Nick and Michael in the car. Bubba looked over at him. Do you consider yourself a gentleman? I suppose. Bubba pointed to the glove compartment. Open that. Take the box out. Nick did as he was told. Bubba was referring to the box of condoms he had been showing off last week. There are only two left, Nick said, peering inside. That's why, Bubba said simply. Michael snorted. You didn't have sex with her eight times before ice cream and the movie. Four times before, three and a half times after, Bubba said. <laughs> it's funny because it's a half time. Mm, I, <laughs> is it though? Because <laughs> I don't, I don't, well, how did he? It's not, it's not funny. It's not funny at all. There's another scene, um, actually pretty similar to that where, um, he's speaking with Michael and uh, he comes out of the bedroom with a box of condoms and he asks Michael if he wants one. Mm -hmm. And Michael says, um, that's all right. You might need the whole box. And then Bubba <laughs> says, I did use a whole box once. Lost three pounds that night. <laughs> Gained it right back, though. It was mostly water. <laughs> he lost oh three God. pounds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. Yeah. So this this next one makes me think of um, the uh, Eternal, the Immortal, the Immortal, the Immortal, right? The Immortal or the Eternal Enemy? <laughs> no, the Immortal, the Grease one. Okay. Okay. Yes, the Immortal. When she had first arrived on the beaches of southern France and seen the people nude sunbathing, it had been a shock. But by the end of the week, when her parents weren't around, of course, she had joined the crowd. Yeah, that is very similar. <laughs> this, <laughs> I, I feel like I know what Pike's trying to say here, but I don't think he's saying it well. In a cheerleader uniform, Claire projected a certain sex appeal. In this reasonable excuse for total nudity, she looked positively nasty. All legs, chest, enough clear brown flesh to exhaust any red-blooded American boy's fantasy reserve. I hated that sentence. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a pool party. What's she supposed to wear? Like, yeah, can and, she just and wear nasty. a normal bathing suit? Like, I, I mean, nasty is not a... Even if you don't like someone, it's not nasty. Yeah. You can go slutty. That's fine. Nasty. Well, because they remember that they were like, but from certain, depending on her mood, she could look nasty or something like mm -hmm. maybe nasty means something different for him. Well, it was the 80s. I don't know what that means. I'm sorry. I don't know. I'm just imagining Pike and he's just like, how can I put this? Ah, oh, she was so she nasty. She was nasty. Ew, nasty. I hate thinking about him thinking of a teenage girl. <laughs> No, no. Nasty. I'm just thinking of how he, how he writes it. I'm, he's no, like, what word should I use? No, yeah, because that is, I agree. No, but that I is. mean, you still are thinking about Pike sitting in front of his computer thinking about a naked teenager. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. But it's still like, I don't know, because like, I figure if he's, no, I don't know. I mean, I'm not yeah. saying it's bad. It is it is that, though. It, it's, no, yeah, because he does It's have a writer sense. writing, and that's fine. And we write, we can we can write about teenagers having sex, and that's okay. It's not fetishization, because it's fiction and that's okay but it is still that i'm not gonna think about him okay that's about fair. that i think um, <laughs> this is fun here 
uh, Polly and Clark before Clark was dating, um, Alice and before Clark became a creepy cat, dead mutant guy. They spent most of their time together necking in her bedroom with the door locked. She finally did take off her top for him and her parents, but they never had sex. He would push her right to the limit and then back off. She knew it was probably for the best, what with all the talk of herpes and AIDS going around. <laughs> Nevertheless, it still frustrated her. I, I mean, as a sex educator, I just, I think it's funny and horrifying how herpes and AIDS are equated, especially in the 80s. That's very problematic there. But yeah, that's the end of my sexy stuff. And I say that wrinkling my nose because apparently I can do as much with my nose as I can with my mouth. Oh, so gross. <laughs> Well, let's move to Die <laughs> Softly, where we talk about moralizing and problematic elements. <sighs> yeah. I mean, okay, so we got more talk of the ghetto and the barrio and, yeah, which we've already talked about. Um, we have the use of uh, a black to describe yeah, Nick. That's the thing that I have. Who, the who would hire who one? Who would hire a black with bloody hair? Yeah. Which? Why? What the fuck? <laughs> like, I, I all I can say is there was a time when that was acceptable terminology, no matter how horrifying it may be for us today. It it, it just I know. So I I know that that's a thing, but it's just wild that this is from a character who's supposed to be like the good guy too. Yeah, I know, right? Like, it's his perspective and he's just like thinking these very racist things. And it's just like, it's wild to read mm -hmm. some of these books with some of these things in them. Oh, and I completely forgot, you know, all my time talking about how awful Russ Desmond is. I forgot. He's the only one that uses the F word to describe gay people. Oh, I, I yeah. I have that highlighted too. Yeah. So Russ is, the worst. Yeah, he's he's terrible. I still think he only dressed that way when he showed up because he didn't know it was a date. I'm not saying anything about him as a person. I'm just saying. That's, that's fair, Cassie. I agree with you. You're right. But You're he's, right. he sucks. He's terrible. Yeah, he sucks. We've got more diet shaming as if there wasn't enough diet shaming already in the rest of the story. Um, Alice straightened herself. No, chocolate gives me acne. It doesn't do that to me, Polly replied, getting the candy out for herself. Oh, no, I, and never mind. I already talked about this. The, the, uh, I gave blood today. What about your diet? Leave me alone, all right? Jesus. <laughs> when you give blood, you need sugar. Yeah. Fuck. Um, we do have, so, so Katie and Cassie, what you've both said here is definitely true that Pike is trying in, in, in un, ineffective ways to present representation, but it, it rubs me the wrong way when Michael's uh, description was, Michael was genuinely colorblind. People were people to him. Yeah. It's like, yeah, you know what, you know who says that? People who are not genuinely colorblind. Yeah, that's, it's, it's very cringy but again like i know some of our people listening sometimes they're like yeah it is a product of its time so we yeah, do acknowledge no, we, that we fully acknowledge that yeah. absolutely you know we do sometimes nitpick but that's why you listen to the podcast yeah and i feel like it's important to be aware of it even when you're yeah to think critically about what you're doing even if it's just like a fun little thing and there's some stuff to think critically about <laughs> Books. Well, and, and there's clear clear moralization here. Michael had never understood why anyone made handguns. They were no good for hunting. They were only good for killing people. I agree, Michael. I agree. Yeah. Let's move <laughs> into the season of passage. I have the weirdest, best section I've ever had on the podcast. It's three lines and they're single sentences. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. the, three different lines for the best. What did this stupid machine expect her to do? Drink water? <laughs> I love that. I don't, don't know why. 
next in a line as good as the as the Shakespearean stage direction exit pursued by Bear. Polly departed to eat large quantities of sugar. <laughs> don't know the context. Don't know it, but I love it. I don't know. And then the last one is about coffins. As far as boxes went, it was nice. But who wanted to be in a box? <laughs> That's like something you'd read on a t-shirt at Hot Topic. <laughs> it, it is... It is sort of underplayed profoundness there that I really <laughs> like. I have one. Yes, please. <laughs> so um, this takes place at the party when Bubba and Alice run into each other. And Bubba says, hello, crackers. He says to <laughs> Alice, hi, Johnny. She replied in the same flat tone. Michael understood Alice's choice of greeting. John was Bubba's real name after all but he had never heard the Crackers nickname before. <laughs> I thought that was like so funny and cute for some reason. It's like they have their own thing. It's like there's yeah. there's depth beyond all the surface we've been handed. Yeah, but they've never interacted throughout the rest of the book. Right. But I thought that was funny. Crackers. <laughs> is he, though, is he calling her like like she's nuts? I mean, that was what I was thinking when I was over oh, okay. yeah, maybe. everything. Yeah. I was like, so, maybe yeah, that's what he meant by that. Yeah, because she did seem like weird and kind of like spacey. And, like, so it's little... one step beyond, hey, crazy. Yeah, like. <laughs> yeah, okay. And she, I mean, that's why and she's just like flatly responding like, hello, <laughs> using his real name. <laughs> I did really like um, when Sarah was screaming at Russ uh, after their terrible date. I have no class, she screamed. You're an hour late. Your truck smells like a cow stall. You practically get me thrown in jail, and now you're pinching money out of my purse. <laughs> that was she awesome. was so mad, like rightfully she mad. Was, and and it was it was pretty great. Like of all the all the things that happened in this book that I liked involve Sarah. <laughs> she always stands up for herself. Mm-hmm. It's good. I like the person selling the tickets. Just like, so what movie do you guys want to see? Yeah. So are we are we doing this or can you move along? We got more people in line. It's a Saturday night. Well, let's move into weird. There's a lot of references to phonies in this book, <laughs> like more than I've seen in any book other than Catcher in the Rye. I don't have a, any any point to that. I just thought it was interesting. Just lots <laughs> of phonies talk. Um, <laughs> tonight, for the first time, she had seen Clark put his arm around Alice. If you would do that in public, there were a lot of other things you might do in private. That is very <laughs> intense innuendo for something that's very, very innocuous. <laughs> This I don't understand. See if you understand it or if it's just nonsense. Um, when Jessica asked uh, Bill to come to the party, her approach had set women's lib back 20 years, she realized, but she didn't care. He'd asked if she'd be there. He was only coming to see her. Her approach does not seem in any way derogatory toward women. Yeah. So I have no idea what that's about. I mean, she asked him to the party, so that's kind yeah. of a feminist thing to do. I mean, she I just, <laughs> all she did was say, yes, she's going to be there when he asked if she was going to be there. So yeah. like he wants to see her there. She said, yes, that has nothing to do with women's lip. It's, it's complete nonsense it. statement. <laughs> Anyway, Maria was a different sort of friend for Jessica. She appeared to be totally uninterested in local gossip, and yet she was fun to be around. That's one of those bizarre connections that Pike likes to make. And yet, she's not bad. Because we all know that you're only fun to be around if you like to if gossip. If you like gossip, right. Yeah. Um, 
<laughs> yeah, this one's fun too. What's up? Michael asked innocently. Jessica pulled him close, squeezed the top of his arm, smiled. I am. <laughs> what? <laughs> like it would make more sense if there was the, like the only person who could have gotten away with saying that in this book is Bubba. <laughs> right? Yeah, if Bubba said it, I would kind of chuckle. But why is Jessica saying, I am? <laughs> I don't understand. <laughs> uh, sitting on the couch in the living room with Maria and Michael, listening to a Beatle album on the stereo. <laughs> and my enunciation of that is true. There's no S on Beatles. So it reminds me of, here's $5, go see a Star War. <laughs> It's uh, one of the Beatles released a solo a, B, album. Oh, okay, it's yeah. A well, Beatle. <laughs> I suppose a Beatle album could describe, let's say, a George, a George album or a Paul <laughs> album or a John. Okay, you're right. You're right. That's just a weird way of saying it. Maybe he just didn't want to be too specific, and he also didn't want to be too general, so he couldn't yeah. go for Beatles, but also oh, he didn't want to name yeah, the specific An album Beatle. by a Beatle. A Beatle. Yes. Uh, we have a little bit of a quaint moment here. Look, why don't you call him? He may have gotten lost. Right. It'll be a snap reaching him on his car phone. Wait, would it not? No, he doesn't have a car phone. The whole the whole oh, joke right. is he okay, doesn't sorry. have a car phone. <laughs> it, out of context, I forgot who was saying no, no. what and oh, where. Yeah, no, so it's, it's, like... it's about Russ, our favorite okay. character, Russ. Okay. Because I was like, wait, that, that would be convenient. That... <laughs> <laughs> it would be great, yeah. Oh, yeah, I agree. <laughs> and, and I only mention it because these days it's much easier to reach people, and I love that. But, okay, so there's one more thing here that I just pulled out because, so you know how in the book they, um, they'll they do the break, uh, you know, an extra space between the paragraphs, and that indicates a shift in the uh, scene, essentially. But we have this one shift where the only reason I know it's Jessica that is referred to as she is because she's with Michael. But otherwise, they never say Jessica. There's literally three paragraphs of she without saying that it's Jessica. It's just bad writing that and bad <laughs> editing. Yeah. So there we go. Shall we move into Pikeisms? Because I've got lots. Yes. Okay. So we got boyfriend stealing. Alice takes Clark from Polly. Jessica wants to take Bill from Claire. Bubba wants to take Claire from Bill. Russ wants Polly, but thinks she's Sarah. What a tangled web of people. Now Pike's food stuff here. Okay. First we've got <laughs> you haven't had dinner? No, I thought we were going to eat together. That's cool. Let's go to the McDonald's in the mall. And then when she doesn't want to go to the McDonald's, if you want, we can go to the Burger King instead. So we got McDonald's and Burger King. Huh? It's a man who likes options. Yeah. And a 31 <laughs> Flavors reference. And then there's... <laughs> So Nick goes to the concession stand at this endless football game and says, I hope you like junk food. I live on it. Michael accepted a hot dog, a tub of popcorn, and a large orange. <laughs> Why? That's worse. No, it's okay, not. Okay, no, good. That's weird. That's weird for you, too, because it I thought weird. that was weird. Yeah. Because if first of all, it's milk. not junk food. I think it may have been a large orange soda. Oh, but I don't know. It's just a large orange. How weird. Yeah. So, so he I don't know if it's a thing of popcorn and a banana and he's like, here's some <laughs> yeah, snacks here, for you, dude. Here, look at all this junk food. Would you like some fruit? <laughs> Cause nothing goes with popcorn like a banana or an orange. <laughs> God, that sounds horrible. <laughs> just like the citrus and popcorn. 
I only, I'm very specific about popcorn. I'll only eat it if I also have Reese's Pieces. So I can eat a couple of popcorns and then put a Reese's oh, Pieces in my mouth. And I then... pour M&Ms in the popcorn. It, they sink to the bottom and I don't get a good handful. It's not a good distribution. Oh, no, it's, it's only when I when I have a bowl. It's not when I'm at the movies. Oh, no, I don't see, at the do movies, that. That's, that's what I do. No. I'm just handful. Nom, 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 like one after the <laughs> other. Just like dipping in like one hand in the box, one hand in the tub, like prime time watching. <laughs> Every now and then, got to take a sip of my big orange. Yeah, <laughs> big orange. <laughs> so we got you two again. Uh, Bubba seduces Claire with a uh, promise of you two tickets. Uh, she says they're one of her favorite bands. But then later he says, ten minutes alone with me," and she won't even remember how to spell you two. <laughs> uh, 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 uh. Oh, Bubba. Yeah. So oh, you incorrigible yeah. scamp. Um, another People magazine slam. It made her sick go, uh, just going into the supermarket and having to look at all those fakes on the cover of People magazine. Mm -hmm. Another Playgirl magazine. It was Bubba's opinion that money and sex were inseparable in the female mind. Thinking about credit cards and spending power, in his opinion, got them more excited than browsing through a Playgirl magazine. <laughs> and then he says, you ready? Then you could blow them dry. <laughs> Filthy. <laughs> So, Katie, I need to ask you a personal question. Did you know what Playgirl magazine was before listening to the podcast? Yeah, I feel like, um, you know, it was something that I knew about, kind of like picturing some mustachioed hunks. <laughs> on... <laughs> I love that they're mustachioed. <laughs> That's how I oh, man. Honestly, I, pictured... I think that is that is probably the <laughs> most accurate description of a playboy uh, playgirl All I can cover. picture is mario literally mario the plumber <laughs> yeah. with his little wrench and like his mustache he's, it's a me so yeah. so in, in this fantasy version <laughs> cassie is he shirtless yes with with like lots of like danny devito level of chest hair He's got chest hair, but he's like, he's turned. So, okay. He's facing you. He's facing back to you. So you can see his plumber's crack. And then oh. he's turned, the torso is turned back toward you. So you can see the hair on the chest. And then wow. he's got one little pinky into his mouth. And he's looking at you playfully with his mustachioed face. So oh. listeners, clearly what we need is for someone to draw this <laughs> and put Playgirl <laughs> uh, magazine text on the cover and yes. send it to Cassie as a present. Because that is amazing. <laughs> so, Katie, you were aware of Playgirl, <laughs> but you were not like some Pike heroines. Not a uh, subscriber. Obsessed with it. <laughs> not a yeah, I wasn't a child subscriber. <laughs> <laughs> she wasn't reading each issue in between classes. At the hospital. I did do. Oh, my God. <laughs> And then the last Pikeism is not knowing how to swim. Um, someone, <laughs> I cut it off, had almost drowned as a child in a backyard pool. She didn't know how to swim. I think it's Jessica. But I'm not sure now because I didn't cut that part out. Yeah, it was Jessica. Jessica didn't know how to swim. And that's all I got for the season of Passage. Does anyone have anything else or shall we move to last act for another rating that's bound to be fascinating? <laughs> I got nothing. <laughs> All right. Well, Katie, now I want to mention at the end of all three of these episodes, I mean, at the end of the third episode, we are going to give an extra rating for the trilogy as a whole. So this is about evaluating the individual pieces. Okay. Okay. So what is your score out of five pikes? Um, I'd give it maybe two pikes. Um, mm. You know, I, 
If you've ever read the Babysitter's Club, at the beginning of each of the books, there's about like two paragraphs where they describe each of the babysitters with their characteristics. And I feel like this whole book was just, it could have been that paragraph. Um, I found it like pretty painful to get through through because like Cassie said I was just waiting for something to happen Mm -hmm. um and it's we're not exaggerating when we say that it's you know the last five pages that the event of the book takes place (laughs) so (laughs) um so I I found that unfortunate but once it does occur I was intrigued because then you know my mind started like thinking back to all of those little things that could have been clues and, and everything mm-hmm. like that. So it was intriguing in a, in a sort of way. Um, but unfortunately it just really didn't hold my attention and I didn't really like the characters that much. Um, so I don't know. It, it wasn't my favorite, unfortunately. Well, that's, that's more than fair. She is so polite. I'm over here like, this is the plot. Fuck this and fuck that. And Katie's just like, unfortunately, I really just didn't like this one. I don't think I cared for it too much in comparison to Pike's other works. And I'm just like, this book sucks. (laughs) So one other thing that I might add is like in the newer edition of Final Friends, I forget what it's called, but it it's like the omnibus of like the three oh, yeah, right. put together and you know it's like the got like the modern cover on it and everything and maybe that format is better like more palatable because you are just getting through one book and right, it just seems it's... like these are the introduction chapters kind of yeah but like it's a big risk to expect people to pick up books two and three after having only released this first book because I wouldn't be that intrigued. (laughs) When I've always felt that way about sets up for trilogies, like, I mean, most of the trilogies I've experienced are movie trilogies and it's a lot harder to continue a movie trilogy than it is to continue a book trilogy that you've been told, okay, well, book two is coming out later this year. Mm -hmm. But in a, in a movie trilogy, I'm always saying, look, Give us a full movie for number one, and then we'll decide if we want to come back for more. (laughs) And unfortunately, I mean, with the way uh, mainstream cinema has gone, uh, very few movies are full stories in the beginning. Uh, But, uh, okay, well, that's a whole other uh, (laughs) rant and tirade there. So I'm going to move on from that. Um, Cassie? Yes. Uh, let me be, let me first preface by saying I have absolutely no idea what grade I'm going to give this. <laughs> okay. okay. So okay. I am um, literally biding time <laughs> by making you go first. Um, okay. So I think if I'm comparing this just pike-wise to the other books that we've read, there are some that I gave like low ratings to. I hate this one so much more than those. So <laughs> I'm gonna like well, I, I can I, I can do a quick like, scan here. The lowest grade the lowest? ever given yeah. is one and a half for Remember Me Two. <laughs> oh, I'm so excited for Remember Me Three coming up. <laughs> I know, right? Hey, I'm, okay. just, I'm just looking forward to talking to Grady again. I really don't care what the book is. Oh no, yeah, same, same, same. Um, okay, so knowing that my worst what book was that you said? Oh, Remember Me Two. Remember okay, Me so- Two. My least favorite. Yeah. I mean, and stuff happens in that book. I didn't like the stuff that happened, but stuff happened. So a lot of stuff happened. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. I'm going to give this one, I'm going to give this one half a pike and then I'm going to give it a little sprinkle of broken light bulb glass so that it equals (laughs) one full thing, but just barely like just very, barely, barely. One. okay like if you poured water into it it would leak out through the cracks because all the pieces aren't there for that light bulb like, like what if just... we gave it what if we gave it 0.99 pikes yeah yeah okay. yeah yeah glassy prickly point nine. yeah it's just it was not good and it was so much and i i understand the need for setup and i don't understand why they didn't combine this with the other books like yeah, i know right no sense like if this were a thick book and half of it were set up in conversation, I probably wouldn't like it, but I wouldn't be as annoyed by 
like Katie said, literally the last few pages when something finally happens and then it ends on the most abrupt cliffhanger that I was like scanning the pages. Like, did this really end here? Am I missing something? Like, were my pages no, torn no, out of this book? Literally <laughs> no, literally the end. Yeah. It's, it's ridiculous. And I, I'm, I'm so sorry to anybody who likes this. I'm not hating on anybody. I'm so happy <laughs> if you enjoyed it. But for me, this is the, the worst of all of his books that I've read because I, I can't like I don't like the people. I don't like what they talk about. I don't like what they're doing. I don't like how they act. The only thing I love was the description of the blood and the paintings and he did that better in other books with more stuff going on that I liked. So, yeah, wow, yeah. this is my this is my lowest rating. I think I am excited though. So that said, I don't want to make it seem like I'm super negative about the other episodes and I don't want our listeners to be like, oh man, this is going to suck. Like, no, I'm very excited to read what happens, especially thank you so much, Katie, for telling me that we're probably going to like it or at least that just more stuff happens because <laughs> I can't imagine how less could happen. Like we wouldn't have a book. It just, <laughs> it'd just be a list of 20 character names and <laughs> like how many of them are blonde and how many of them are tanned. And I just, what if, what if in the next one, this school combined with another school and oh they just god. introduced another group of friends oh good god <laughs> oh, why can i is it can i just look i, I don't want to spoiler but i do need to, i have an entire page almost nearly underlined because there was so much like exposition about the schools joining together that i did not give a single shit about that right. never came back like it never ever. came like, back it is so pointless. Like these teens could have been having any sort of party for any reason. There was no reason to do this as a plot. Like, yeah, I, I mean, especially since <gasps> most of Pike's books have teens throwing a party for no yes. apparent reason, and then Just somebody the getting murdered it. or or dying. So, like, he clearly Why can do it. Schools like Mesa and Tab. Like, w did you have a contract with these schools that you had to put them in your book? Like. Why did you do that? I just, yeah. Anyways, and why did you keep say, Tab as the school that you wanted tab, to, be able to go just, to? Why not Mesa? Mesa's a better name. Oh, God, I didn't even think about that, that they did leave the ones. Man, I just, I can't with this. This is, there's too much I don't like about this for me to give it any more than, like, one partial point nine nine. Okay, point nine nine. Point nine yeah, nine repeating. I, How about that? You can you can put one on there if it makes it easier for the list. No, whatever. It's point nine nine. <laughs> That's fine. It was yeah. It's it's not my fave. Okay. Um. So now that I have to give a score, <laughs> I'm. <laughs> I'll yeah. give it one. Oh. I'll give it one. Um. Because. Uh. Shit. <laughs> I mean, look. I can't even figure out a reason to give it one. <laughs> no, you, you know what? No, no, actually. So, Remember Me Too is still the absolute worst for me. Really? Okay? The worst. I hate it so much. Oh, my God. But Last Act is better than Final Friends 1. And Last Act was my other one pike so this isn't even getting a full pike this is getting a broken in half pike the other <laughs> half is gone it's 0.5 maybe the other half is going to be in the other two books but it's, it's i hope so <laughs> you know what honestly if the other books are anywhere better than this that half pike is going to get added to my score on the other <laughs> end just because i needed to take it away from this book yeah, and, and the the best part too is that we're doing all three in a row. So we've got like a solid like I but these do get better, you all said, or Katie said. So <laughs> I didn't say that, Cassie. Yeah, right. Didn't say well, you all isn't maybe the people listening and Katie. Like I hope there's other people because I I feel like there are some people who said they loved this trilogy. They there were like, are. Oh, there I love are that. Definitely yeah. people who love this trilogy. So I, I don't want to, I really don't want to shit on anybody who loves it. I want to make that super clear. Like it's, it's the worst book in my opinion, but I understand if you like conversation as a book theme and if that's what you want to read about, just people talking and talking and talking and talking. And that's me as somebody on a podcast talking about people talking. Come on. They like, won't stop talking. They won't stop talking. <laughs> I think it's, um. Sort of just that it's not scary at all, and that's sort well, of yeah, what we come too, to yeah. desire. Even from if a it were weird, Pike book. yeah, like if it had aliens or something, I'd be like, all right, we got a little like space exploration <laughs> up in here. Like, 
but nothing. No, where are my space vampires? Where is my lizard people? Like, well, they did mention uh, a pinup vampire who's naked all the time. That's the movie they went to see. I wanted to read that book. I would see that movie. <laughs> yeah, because that sounded better. I think if you um, really like this trilogy, it's probably because you just have looked at the story as a whole. And yeah. I mm-hmm. kind of doubt that anybody who loves the trilogy likes the first <laughs> book. That's, <fair. laughs> That's totally fair. And it, I think it sucks too, because when I was younger, I, I don't remember it, but I know I read the first one and I, I yeah. disliked it so much that I never bothered with the other two. So he lost yeah, his tail. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man. Okay, so let's <laughs> let's move on. Let's move past. Let's uh let's say uh Katie, tell our listeners where they can find you and listen to your podcast, which is awesome. <laughs> Thanks, Cooper. Um if you're interested, you can follow me on Instagram at the haunted outfit. I draw pictures of outfits from crazy nineties teen horror books. <laughs> <laughs> and I have a podcast called Super Chillers. Um again, where we talk about nineties teen horror books. <laughs> <laughs> Our most recent episode covered a Sweet Valley High Christmas murder mystery. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Not even Hallmark will do a combined Christmas and murder. It was bonkers. <laughs> <laughs> Cassie, where can our listeners find more of you online? You can find me on Instagram or Twitter at Control Alt Cassie, C T R L A L T C A S S I E. I also have a blog at Let's Get Galactic.com, and you can find my art at Shop Let's Get Galactic.com. I sell books and bookmarks and resin and a bunch of other colorful, horror-y things. Horrory. Horrory. <laughs> Horror- 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 I was, I, yeah, I said it and I was like, man, that sounded like something I didn't mean to say. Horror- but- <laughs> <laughs> you can find me at Cooper S. Beckett.com, at Cooper S. Beckett on all the social media. If you are at all curious about a sex education and books, I actually just signed a contract for a publishing uh, gig for a new sex ed book called the pegging book and again if you are not interested in hearing about sexuality do not google what pegging is cassie tell our listeners where they can find more of the pike cast online you can follow us on all social media at the pike cast all one word no underscore anything we would really love it if you shared your pike books with us you can use the hashtag show us your pike and we'll share them in our stories or if you share them with us on twitter we'll retweet you um, and then we also have a Patreon, and it is patreon.com slash thepikecast. And that helps us with a lot of stuff behind the scenes. You'll also get access to our Discord, where we talk about the books, and we give you early access to our episodes. So it's a super fun place. You should come hang out with us. Definitely. And listeners, as you may have surmised, your homework for next week is book two of <laughs> the Final Friends trilogy. And that book is called the dance so i hope we don't have to wait till the whole entire like end of the book to get to the actual dance no the entire book's going to be at the dance and they're just asking have you seen uh have you seen michael (laughs) they're just walking through while the music's playing (laughs) just walking around asking if anyone has seen each other yeah that's it but anyway (laughs) until next time listeners uh thank you again katie thank you katie Thanks, Pleasant Kyle. dreams. Woo! You survive the night, friends. You can peek out from under your covers and see the first blues of dawn out the window. Thanks for spending the night with the Pike Cast, and we hope you'll join us again next time. Until then, Pikers, pleasant dreams. But I I need to take us on another segue to something more interesting than this book. Um, <laughs> Roger Ebert famously hated the movie Brown Bunny, which is a Vincent Gallo movie. It's terrible. Don't bother watching it. It's notable only because Chloe Sevigny, who uh, was dating or married to Vincent Gallo, gave him a real blowjob in the movie. <laughs> <laughs>
That's the only notable thing in it. But uh, Vincent Gallo was pissed off that Roger Ebert gave him a bad review and called him fat. (laughs) Like real high stakes for Roger Ebert. And Roger Ebert said, yes, but someday I won't be fat. But you will always be the director of Brown Bunny. (laughs) So that's what that made me think of. But somehow that's bitchier for some reason. Yeah. Killing people and things, not only just people. That's true. But mostly people. They hunt and stuff too, but yeah. Not not handguns. You're not hunting. You can't hunt with a handgun? There's no kind of handgun you, you can What are you hunt? hunting for with a handgun? I, okay, look, I'm going to be honest. I don't go hunting. I'm not going <laughs> yeah, to. No. I, I just thought people could. The idea with a handgun is you should be closer than a far away hunting thing. So like a handgun is for shooting someone in the same room. Oh, I see. And a that's rifle what is for a shooting rifle, someone. Right. From you know, far away. Yeah. Half a well, mile away. Well, not someone away. when you're yeah. hunting. Or, or, no, no, you're right. Not Jeez someone. Louise. For, well, you know, I, I feel like... Uh, no, I'm not going to go there. No, no, no. But hunting, so, okay, that is good to know. Suffice to know. say, suffice you don't use to handguns say, I, I am, a, I am a, not the biggest fan of the Second Amendment. Let's move <laughs> on. Uh, I, I completely lost where I am here. Okay. We're like, guns, no, we hate guns. We'll no. just go on another tangent The again. podcast hates guns. There we we go. don't like them. They're scary. No. Though I'm not speaking for Katie because I don't know where she stands. Really? You don't? <laughs> well, I don't officially know where you stand. I can make assumptions, but I try not to do that in general. I would guess that you also, like the Pipecast, don't yes. terribly like guns. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> So with that, with us all being on the same page there, 